I'm Barry Gilrath, and this is Fabric of Family. We came on a Sunday. The world part of the Bible was back a part of what I do as a minister. I'm Barry Gilrath. This is Fabric of Family, a program designed to address family needs from a biblical perspective. We appreciate you joining us for our program today. You know, the Bible says, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 16. Then Jesus would say, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Christian, what is your Jerusalem? That is, what is your starting point to bring the gospel into all of the world? You know, I think it would be correct to say that your starting point is all of those that are within your sphere of influence right now. The relationships we have right now, those that are, that are already baked in, so to speak. Although it does not necessarily have to be, successful evangelism is often predicated upon previously established relationships. And you know, certainly that would include our family. In our program today, that's what we're going to talk about. Soul winning, specifically as it is related to the family. Stay with us. Thank you for viewing The Fabric of Family. If you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Or you may contact us at our website, jhcc.org. That's jhcc.org. Or you can call us at 256-764-6291. That's 256-764-6291. Our hope and prayer is to bring you and your family closer to God. Well, it's time to begin our panel discussion today. And I have with me as a guest, Michael Clark. Michael is the evangelist for the Somerville Church of Christ, and this would be in Somerville, Tennessee. Also with us is Jameson Stewart. And Jameson has been with us before, as Michael has as well. Jameson preaches for the Smithville Church of Christ in Smithville, Mississippi. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us today for our program. We're talking about soul winning, but really from the perspective of the family because, you know, that's, that's what this program emphasizes. And I don't know um, how often we, we think of soul winning and, and relate it to our family, but certainly there's a very strong application that could and should be made. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about how that, uh, that the one who wins souls is wise. And, you know, we need to be wise when it comes to our families. We need to be striving to, uh, to win our families to Christ Jesus. Of course, the way that we do that, the Bible teaches, is, is through something called the gospel. Uh, the gospel is a word that uh, if we grow up in uh, Bible classes and in church services, we're probably familiar with. Uh, but maybe for someone who is watching the program today and and has heard that word, but really, really don't know what that word encompasses or what it means. Uh, what would you say to someone who says, well, what is this gospel that I keep hearing about? The gospel means good news. And I mean, the, the, the best way to describe that is if we were driving down the road in our neighborhood and noticed that the gas station that we normally frequent has gas being sold for 50 cents a gallon, I think we'd be calling a few people to tell them about it and to say, hey, guess what? 
get your get your gas cans and tell everyone you know go down there while it lasts and I've often seen posts on Facebook that say gas has gone down a dollar at the local station over here on this road and people will say man I wish I could get there in time and so we all clamor to hear good news and when it's something genuinely good we don't usually have a problem sharing it why is it good news as opposed to bad news well, the good news of Jesus Christ, just for example, uh, we think about what He has done for us mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we can have our, be cleansed of our sins. We have hope of a home in heaven. Uh, you know, we, we enjoy hearing good news in our society. Uh, I suppose uh, to an extent we also uh, maybe enjoy is not the right word, but you look at all the news networks today and what's on most of them. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily good news. They understand something about what people like to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to convince people why hearing good news and the good news about Jesus is the most important news they will ever hear. But you know, the good news about Jesus is there because there was bad news about mankind. And what was that bad news? bad news was that we were sinners. Romans 5, 8 says Christ died for the ungodly. And Romans 3, 23 says that all mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, the only way for us to be reconciled to Jesus Christ, the way that we once were in a covenant relationship with Him, was to have good news brought. And that's just it. I, I've, I've been in the doctor's room when the doctor came in and told me that I had a disease that I was going to have the rest of my life that's not curable. And that's not a good piece of information to be given. But I've also been able to sit in the doctor's room with people when someone comes out and the doctor says, we've got good news. What we thought you had, you don't have to have. We can fix it. We can do all of these things. And that's really what Jesus said to us. You were in sin. You don't have to be anymore. Yeah, that's right. Well, as we think about the scriptures, there was a, a passage that I wanted us to look at. If you don't mind turning over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, I believe it's verse 42. And uh, there's an example there where an uh, individual comes in contact with Jesus. And he experiences that excitement, uh, that joy, uh, by the fact that he, he's near Christ and learns about Christ. And, you know, what does he do? Well, let's, let's read it and see. When it, when it, uh, Michael, if you don't mind. He brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. All right, he brought who to Jesus? Who, who was brought to Jesus in that passage? Uh, in that passage, uh, Andrew, okay. Simon Peter's brother, he went and he found his brother right. and told him, We found Messiah. We yeah. found the Christ. And then he brings Peter to Jesus. All right. <laughs> uh, do, we, do we share good news with our family? As a general rule, I guess is what I'm saying. As a general rule, uh, we do. Uh, all the time, you know, yeah. someone will come home from work or, or maybe they've heard something or seen something on Facebook right. say, I've got some great news. You're never going to believe what happened today. Well, and all mm. of us have, have children on, mm. on the panel today, and I know what that was like to be able to tell my mom and dad that Megan and I were pregnant, and I'm sure Jameson remembers that, and you remember telling your parents that and your in-laws and the joy that was had for the great relationship that you're now going to be having with not just your wife anymore, but also that baby boy or girl or children plural and bringing that into the family dynamic and there, there's usually no sorrow when you announce that you're pregnant. Uh, I know there are complications that can arise and sometimes babies are lost and that's a horrible thing but mm -hmm. when we find out we're pregnant we don't sit there and go, oh man, you know, when we're, when we're excited, we, we tell everybody we know. We can't wait to tell people. And I remember when we found out we were pregnant, we were told, you know, you need to wait this amount of months before you tell everybody. That's hard for me because mm -hmm. I like to tell people good news and I wanted, I wanted mm -hmm. to tell everybody that I knew. And so generally speaking, with our family especially, we can't wait to tell them the good news that we have in our lives. But there are certain things that go on in our life that maybe sometimes we're hesitant to share with family members. Uh, and, of course, that would fall into the category of bad news. Uh, you know, that, that's not exactly something we get excited about. Uh, if there's something that, that's not good going on in our life or something that's not good we're going to be facing uh, in our life. Uh, but uh, why is it that, that we, uh, I suppose, are uh, more reserved in, in, in sharing bad news with our family? What are some reasons for that? Well, we think about maybe... Uh, why we don't want to share bad news uh, with our family or maybe why sometimes people are hesitant to, to share the good news about Jesus Christ is it's first, you know, in order to do that, 
they first have to be brought face to face with their own sin and with the bad news that look, you know, your life is not what it should be. So why why then do we? Uh, and and I'm speaking in generality, so please understand. But why is it that that people in general are more hesitant to share? Uh, information about uh, the church that you read about in the Bible, about uh, Jesus Christ, who He was, what what He says, what He offers. But if you're talking about maybe a sports team and you're, uh, you know, at a, a family event or a family gathering, you know, that can uh, be a very uh, common area of discussion, and people enjoy participating in that. But you don't bring up, you know, religion. We, we, we've heard that before. You know, don't discuss politics, don't discuss religion. Why, why is that the case, if it's good news? Well, if it's good news, people need to hear it. Uh, it, it seems that that rule about religion and politics, I've heard that too. People somehow still manage to fit politics in, mm -hmm. uh, no matter yeah. what. Uh, but for some reason, we're shy about the gospel. Uh, and I think it goes back to is maybe there is a genuine concern sometimes, and I think it is a good concern, is we, we don't want to do something wrong and push people away. Um, and while I understand that concern, uh, we need to make sure the emphasis is we need to have a Christ-like attitude, not only in talking about the gospel, but in anything we're talking about, and realize that the Word of God is what they need to hear. If we don't ever tell them and show them what God has said in His Word, then they are never going to be able, we mentioned earlier, be cleansed of their sins and reconciled to Christ. That's never going to happen for them. Do you think intimidation falls under the category of why some maybe don't share uh, biblical matters with their family members? I think it's part of that. I also think, kind of just real quick, touching back on something he said, we will fight tooth and nail for our favorite team. And we all three here might have different football teams that we root for. And my opinion is my team is the best. And your opinion is going to be that your team's the best. And we'll all disagree on it. And the truth of the matter is nobody can really definitively say who's the best college football team or who's the best NFL team. Because if we could, then everybody would need to root for that team if they are the best. The problem with the gospel is if someone finds out that God is real, God sent his son to die, and he expects us to live that way, we then become obligated to live that way. And I think many of the issues that we face in our family is nobody wants to make that, that decision to say, mm -hmm. yes, God is real, because they know what follows that. Not only is God real, but now I've got to live like God's real. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to act like God's real. I can disagree with you on football, but I don't want to talk about politics or religion because there is a right and wrong answer in, in politics. There is a right and wrong answer in religion. And if I'm wrong, then I'm the one that has to change, and I don't want to be the one to do that. Do you think that as, as a family member, sometimes people are afraid or fearful of harming that family relationship if they talk about uh, biblical matters and there's a disagreement? Uh, being, I, I think that's part of it is uh, being afraid to rock the boat perhaps as far as may, maybe where the family relationship is at that moment is you know it's in a good place mm -hmm. okay uh, maybe there's been problems in time past but right now we're in a good place and there's some fear in mm -hmm. maybe losing that relationship with some of those family members well and we have the issue today too of we have people in families that have lost loved ones and they weren't members of the Lord's Church and therefore to bring up the Lord's Church in front of this family is also not just to say that these people need to repent but that grandma and grandpa have no hope or that mama and daddy are lost mm. or bro brother and sister, son or daughter, whoever it may be. And that's a, that's a tall ass too but we have to remember Luke 16, 27 through 28. The rich man in torment said, I don't want my family to come to this place. And so the argument that people want to use, let's not talk about religion because you're telling me that grandma and grandpa are gone and they're lost, is not an argument that grandma and grandpa would even be making in torment. Mm. Because the rich man said, I don't want anybody else to come here. Send anybody that you can to tell my five brothers the truth of the gospel. Well, that's a good stopping place uh, for uh, just a break. We're going to watch a, a, a short segment. It's a word for the family. Harrison Chastain, a fine gospel preacher over in the Florence, Alabama area, uh, he's going to deliver a short devotional message to us. He's going to be talking about marriage, and then we'll wrap up our discussion for today. I'm Harrison Chastain with the Jackson Bird Church of Christ, and this is a word for the family. Martin Luther King, Jr., Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, 
When you think about these names, perhaps you think that these are some of the greatest people to ever live. And you would be correct. What do the, all these people have in common? They may be from different walks of life, different backgrounds. They may have ministered to different groups of people. But one thing that they had in common was they were selfless people. They put the interest of others before themselves. Ironically enough, the greatest man to ever live, Jesus Christ, was also a selfless person. He taught the importance of being selfless when he told his disciples that if anyone wants to be great among you, he must be your servant first, that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. When we think about the idea of marriage, marriage is a team institution. Marriage is an institution that was designed by God way back in the book of Genesis chapter 2 after he had created everything he saw that his prized creation, man, was alone. And in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, I don't want man to be alone. I'm going to make a help meet for him. I'm going to make someone comparable to him. In order to have a great marriage, we must be selfless to our spouse. Let's wake up every day. Husbands, think about waking up every day with the mindset of what can I do to serve my wife today? Wives, wake up in the morning and say, what is it I can do to serve my husband today? It doesn't have to be anything extravagant. It could just be something as simple as making the other one lunch. It could be something as simple as picking up the kids for someone else. Think about how we can serve our spouse. If we think that marriage is going to work with us being self-centered, we've got another thing coming. When we read the scriptures, we read things like Philippians 2 verse 4, that we need to put others' interests above our own. And that is correct, but that is especially true in marriage. Marriage is a team effort, and one thing we must do is to serve our spouse, to be selfless with our time, talents, and resources. And it is only then that our marriage will improve and to be what God wants it to be. Well, it's time to continue this portion of our program today where we have a panel discussion and discuss an important subject related to the family. We're talking about soul winning as it relates to our family today. Uh, Michael Clark and uh, Jameson Stewart, uh, we want to continue the discussion that we had just a moment ago. Uh, I want us to think about Joshua in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And, you know, Joshua, in that particular uh, context, he was uh, demonstrating courage. Uh, there was no fear in Joshua, as we talked about earlier in our programming, that sometimes people have regarding uh, their family and, and their faith. And, and Joshua said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Uh, you know, whether the, the, the gods of your fathers that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you dwell, but he says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, you know, as we think about that, he, he did something there that some people would take offense to. Uh, he talked about their ancestors. <laughs> he says, uh, are you going to be like your ancestors who worship these false gods on the other side of the flood? Or, or, or are you going to be like your family members now who are living amongst the Amorites. He says, you, you do what you're, you want to do, but this is what we're going to do. My family, we're going to serve the Lord. I mean, isn't that a wonderful example for Christian families today? It is, and it, uh, in thinking about what he said there, is it's a reminder. Uh, oftentimes, you know, teachers, preachers will say something along these lines is, you know, you can't hold hands with the devil and with God. Is Joshua is reminding them you can't, you know, you can't serve God one day of the week and then serve these other false gods the rest of the day of the week. You can't, you can't do both. You've got to choose who are you going to serve. Well, and they, he even says in verse 19 of the same chapter, you can't serve God. God's a holy God. Mm -hmm. He's a just God. And, and you're not going to serve him. And in fact, he didn't trust that they would fulfill their, their 
commandment that they had promised and their pledge, I should say, because in verse 27, he put up a large statue, a rock, and he says, this rock is going to stand as a symbol every time you look at it of the covenant that you've made today. And Judges 2.10 tells me that after Joshua and all of the religious leaders of that time had died, there arose a generation that didn't know the Lord, and I wonder how many of them were there that day and would look during their time of ungodliness and see that statue, that, that covenant, the, the reminder, and think, we're so far off, but we're not doing it anymore. Joshua knew what these people were going to do, so he was, he was actually, like you said, really throwing a gauntlet down because he knew their propensity for, for wickedness and for sinfulness. Mm. But you can see that Joshua had an influence, a great influence, yeah. on his own family. Oh, yeah. And I think that kind of ties in to the question I wanted to raise about the importance of nurturing our relationships. I mean, really, how effective can we be as a soul winner in our family if we don't have good relationships with our family? Right, exactly. Uh, I, I, in studying for this, I uh, looked it up. The word nurture appears one time in the King James Version. It appears in Ephesians 6, verse 4. Uh, that word means instruction, mm -hmm. discipline, education. So in thinking about that, that means that we are going to have to invest time. We're going to have to invest effort. We're going to have to put love in to our family and demonstrate the love that we have in teaching them mm -hmm. the gospel. Nurturing means we are putting in time. We're not just you know, letting our family do whatever, but we are going to try and teach them and educate them on what is right and what is wrong. Yeah, and we have to remember the idea there of nurture also means to grow. Yeah. And 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can my family do that if I'm not doing it? And it starts with the father, but it starts with the mama as well. And if the mother and father are trying to do their best to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. their nurturing is going to trickle all the way down to the children, and that family will be nurtured in the right way, and it will be a soul-winning family yeah. for Christ. Yeah. And, and in addition to this nurturing that, that you gentlemen are talking about here, there's also the nurturing in the relationship itself, yeah. like between a parent and a child. Absolutely. Um, between a husband and a wife. And, and I guess the point that I'm making here would be this. Uh, if I'm going to have a positive impact as far as Christ is concerned in my children's life, then I actually... Uh, need to have a relationship with my kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, anybody, as they say sometimes, you know, it doesn't doesn't take a, a whole lot for someone to make a baby, but to be a daddy, to be a father, you know, that that's hard. That that's difficult because you do have to invest time and uh, your energies into to, to having that relationship with a child. So, you know, if I want to save my family, if I want to be a soul winner in my family. And whether we're talking about a spouse or children or in-laws or cousins or whatever the case may be, uh, I need to have a good relationship with them. And I need to understand that. And I need to work on that, having a good, positive relationship where we can talk about ball or talk about the weather or talk about what's going on in our life. And, and uh, you know, if I have that kind of relationship, then that is going to enable uh, discussions that are even more important, like what we're talking about today. I, I hope that when my son gets old enough, and I'm sure Jameson will say the same thing, that when he runs into trouble, I'm the first one he wants to call. Because that means I've done my job as a father, to be someone who's given him good advice and nurtured mm -hmm. in the right way and has that relationship where he yeah. says, Dad knows how to take care of this. All right, so excellent point. And, and, and let's think about uh, soul winning now from a family unit's perspective. How can uh, my family as a whole uh, be more active and diligent in soul winning? What are some things that are important? Uh, well, maybe one of the first things that comes to mind is we've talked about it a little bit is by the example that we set. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. Jesus, after talking about that his disciples are going to face persecution, he then says, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, and all that is so that people will see the way we live and it will bring glory to God. So we think about being a soul winning family, if we're going to be able to bring others to Christ, then we are going to have to set an example that points mm. people back to Christ. And see, so that, that would include the mother, that includes the father, that also includes the, the children who are 
uh, of an accountable age as well. And we can't put other people's souls before we put our own souls mm. first. Yeah. Our souls have to be the most important, so we put souls first above sports, homework, extracurricular activities of any sort because those things pale in comparison to our eternity and to other people's yeah. eternity too. Okay, yeah. any other ways that are, are things that are important in order to be a soul winning family? Uh, another thing that comes to mind is we need to, you know, parents need to take this seriously and they need to impress upon their children the seriousness of this is when Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, go and make disciples, uh, that wasn't optional. Uh, we tend sometimes to maybe, in we, speaking generally, uh, downplay that that's actually a command. It's kind of more, if you have time, uh, mm -hmm. do it. Uh, yeah. That is a command. That's So we need to impress upon our family if we are going to win souls and understand that's not optional. That is supposed to be a part, I mean, that's our mission. That's a part of who we are as the Lord's disciples. That's right. The first century church continued in the apostles' doctrine. Part of that doctrine would have been what they did in Acts 8-4, going everywhere preaching the Word, and that's exactly what we need to be doing today, too. All right, real quickly, what's one thing that I can do to get started being a soul winner? Jameson, give me one thing. One thing, I would pray with your family, pray for opportunities to reach others, and then be looking for those doors to be opened by God. Same. Okay. All right, you don't Absolutely. add anything to that? Absolutely. Okay. Always work. Always yep. work. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us on Fabric of Family today, and we hope that uh, those who are watching this program at home have enjoyed this discussion time, and uh, we look forward to being with you again uh, very soon. Thank you for viewing the Fabric of Family. If you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Never conceal my Savior and guide. He is a light. Or you may contact us at our website, jhcc.org. That's jhcc.org. Or you can call us at 256 764 6291. That's 256 764 6291. Nine one. Two mansions above, singing his praises gladly. I'm walking. Our hope walking and prayer is to bring you and your family closer Jesus to God. You know, it is my privilege and honor to come before you on a regular basis, and to be able to talk about these various uh, biblical matters that deal with the family. Fabric of Family is overseen by the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. And uh, this is a cooperative effort of Churches of Christ. Uh, some of these congregations are in your area, as well as individual Christians that help support this program. We have a free Bible correspondence course that we always want to hold before you because we, we want you to take advantage of that. If you'd like to study the Bible in the privacy of your home, please don't forget that and just let us know and we'll be glad to get that started. Until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath, Jr., minister of the Stutz Road Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, wishing you and your family a wonderful week. Hallelujah, find the glory, revive us again.